Fast Forward Productions. The women are speaking. I'm always approaching this work from a place that maybe, in contrast to more traditional conservation, values like individual being over just kind of like a collective species, for example, or just values kind of the inherent worth of other animals, despite them maybe or maybe not having any direct benefit to us as people. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now, the farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. Hello, everyone. It's November already. And this weekend, we have the time change coming up. That's when we go from daylight savings time back to standard time. So how do you feel about this time change, Emma? How does it affect you? Well, is this where we gain an hour or lose an hour? Fall back. For instance, the way I experience it mostly is instead of getting dark at 630, it's going to start getting dark at 530. Oh, yeah. Don't love that part. (laughs) <laughs> but it does sort of feel like in a weird way that, yeah, you're like, it's already that time. I don't know. I don't really have strong feelings about it. I kind of welcome it as a transition time to be like, okay, we're getting into cozy time, even though it's already felt cozy for a few weeks, but it does feel a little bit more cozy. Yeah. I'm going to be talking about this a little bit in my next episode of Slow Living Through the Seasons, which should be up next week if all things go as planned. And we'll also be talking about the moon calendar as always and what's up in the November garden. But with gardening season now pretty much over here in our region, we're actually going to be talking more about what not to do this time of year and also how the calendar can help guide you in other things besides gardening. So if you're curious about that, be sure to listen in. But going back to the time change for a minute, Like you, Emma, one thing I notice in particular with the earlier darkness is that I tend to go to bed a lot earlier because it is cozy time. And even if I'm not going to go to sleep right away, there's really just this pull to get settled down and snuggled in. And that reminds me of how much I love the all natural wool comforter that we sell in the Lady Farmer Marketplace by Holy Lamb Organics. And that reminds me of the interview we had with Jason Schaefer. He's the owner of Holy Lamb. We talked to him three years ago now. Can you believe it's been that long? Mm -mm. And if you'll remember, Emma, that was such an incredibly enlightening conversation about the importance of the materials in your bedding. So I'm encouraging listeners to go back and listen to that. It's episode number 19. (laughs) That's way back there. And even though you'll hear a much earlier version of our sound and production, the information in this conversation is something you want to hear. Believe me. Yeah. So another shout out to Holy Land Bedding. If you're looking for to update or refresh your bedding, winter coming is a great time to do that. Holy Lamb is super high quality. They're just the best people. We really are so happy to be collaborating with them. And I also have the all natural wool comforter. I have the one that's, it's it's called the dual wool comforter. So it's like two comforters that tie together. And it's great because in the winter we put them together and we haven't actually put them back together yet because in the summer you can remove one of the layers. So you have like a lighter wool comforter. So it's kind of like two in one. 
It's really great. And another thing that I love is their wool pillows. They're amazing. And if you haven't slept on a real wool pillow with like organic cotton on the outside, it's really wonderful. So I recommend that too. I actually need to get a couple of more wool pillows. I'm not sure what's happened to our pillows, but it seemed to have walked away. If this sounds interesting to you and you want to go back and listen to the episode number 19, just keep in mind that that was three years ago. And you'll hear in the intro that we were just getting ready for our first virtual retreat in 2020, which is another flashback. And that was obviously the first year of COVID. And Holy Lamb had sponsored our live podcast recording with Natalie Channon of Alabama Channon, which is another great episode. So many fun things to look back on. So thank you, Holy Lamb Organics, for being our partners for all of these years. Your products represent everything The Good Dirt is about. The quality and sustainability of your materials, the way you run your business, your commitment to creating sustainably handcrafted products for a healthy, eco-friendly life and home. So y'all go listen to that episode so you'll know what to look for in your bedding. Then go to the Lady Farmer Marketplace at the link in the show notes and order yours. So moving on to our guest for today's interview, we have Allison Zach. Yes, Allison is a yoga teacher, a wildlife conservationist, and the author of Wild Asana, Animals, Yoga, and Connecting Our Practice to the Natural World. This book explores the animals that inspire familiar yoga poses, you know, like the dog in Down Dog, or the monkey of Monkey Mind, and the eagle, the pigeon, the cat cow. She draws the connection between our bodies, our minds, and these animals that inspire our practice. Allison lives in Northern Virginia with her husband, her dog, and her two budgies, which are birds. In addition to her writing and spiritual practices, she runs the Human Beaver Coexistence Fund, which is an organization that educates the public about the benefits of coexisting with beavers and provides resources and financial support to address human beaver conflict using non-lethal management strategies. So that means that she helps to find solutions that are other than just killing beavers. Yes. Allison studied human wildlife conflict in graduate school, then worked for six years in environmental education before founding this organization. She is intrigued by beavers in particular because few other animals have such an impact on the world around them. Before this interview, neither of us had ever heard of the field of human wildlife conflict. But in talking to Allison, we're so glad that great minds like hers are helping to bridge the gap between people and animals. She amazed us, she made us laugh, and she gave us lots to think about. Her genuine love for the natural world is evident in her conversation, her writing, and her work. So here's Allison Zach, wildlife conservationist and author of Wild Asana. So I'm Allison Zach, and I wear a few different hats. I'm the director of a nonprofit that helps people manage some human wildlife conflict issues. I am an author and a yoga teacher and a former anthropologist. And all of those things might sound a little bit random, but kind of where I am in my life and career right now is kind of a perfect blend of all of my interests and passions. And I have figured out how to merge them all into one kind of life. So I studied anthropology in school. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in anthropology, but was always very interested in wildlife and kind of like the human involvement in how we interact with and conserve wildlife. And so my background in the social sciences has definitely kind of led me to the work that I do with human beaver coexistence, for example. And then I have been a longtime yoga practitioner as well and trained as a teacher in 2020, which was kind of a bad timing <laughs> for obvious reasons. The book that I have that came out in June is kind of a mix of all of the things that I love and that I do in my work as well, combining kind of our relationships with animals and um, how we can connect more with nature through yoga or through a mindfulness practice and then kind of inspired by all of the 
wildlife research that I've done over the years and encounters with other animals. This is such a fascinating combination of things. And I would just love to hear you talk about how these passions intersect for you, the yoga, the wildlife conservation, and the environmentalism and all those things. Yeah, it's not always clear and easy. (laughs) I definitely think that I've changed over the years already and kind of how I approach that intersection. You know, I came from a more scientific, academic approach to animals just from my studies and had to kind of realize that my own more authentic connection with animals was a little bit more personal, a little bit more spiritual. And so there are contradictions. (laughs) And I can give another example of that in the work that I do with the nonprofit. You know, there's this element of my work that I am essentially, let's say, trying to convince a landowner that instead of trapping a beaver, that they should keep allowing that beaver to live on their land. And I am having to appeal to what that landowner values and who that landowner is and how they identify when I'm arguing for the value of this other being that I personally believe is inherently valuable. But in my work, when I'm approaching it from a professional perspective, I have to pretend like the value of the beaver is in its economic benefit or its ecological benefit, you know, that sort of thing. And so it's complicated at times, but I finally have gotten to a place where I can kind of authentically through my work, kind of believe what I believe about our relationships with animals and still work in a professional sense within other people's values and identities. It can be challenging. So that's interesting when you say you have to sort of pretend, and I I know what you're saying, is you sort of have to uh, frame it in a way to communicate your goal to the landowner. Exactly. Say, so you say you, you have to sort of frame it in a way, and it's in, it's environmental benefit and it's economic benefit. So go a little more into the benefits that you see. I think I know what you're headed for, but I want to hear you talk about it. Yeah. I always joke that I'm like, I'm half scientist, half mystic, (laughs) which means that there is still definitely a very scientific part of me that understands the world through observing other animals or learning from books, (laughs) because I'm a total book nerd, learning about animals from things that other people have experienced. But then there's the part of me that finds the most value and the most meaning in my direct experiences with other animals or within nature. And so that's kind of the mystic side of things, right? And it doesn't hold as much weight necessarily when you're talking to a landowner like, well, I just was visiting this beaver pond and I felt like the world was just a better place. Like, don't you want to save the beaver now? (laughs) It's not going to always be as compelling for someone who didn't have that experience. You know, I am always approaching this work from a place that maybe in contrast to more traditional conservation values like individual being over just kind of like a collective species, for example, or just values kind of the inherent worth of other animals, despite them maybe or maybe not having any direct benefit to us as people. Yes, and I understand how that is a difficult thing to communicate in our current culture. (laughs) And yeah, with humans, the way we behave and perceive our surroundings now, it's very, very nuanced, but I get it. It really is. And, you know, some I work with people who are maybe a little less comfortable with that nuance or with that kind of like contradiction. And so one of the things that I'm always preaching is the wrong word, but like, it's okay. It's okay for us to like have those contradictions in our work. Like that means that we're like in this really real, meaningful, like true interconnection with the rest of the world. It's a good thing. Yes, it is very much so. You have such a wonderful winding path and you've done such a good job of laying it out for us. But I wonder if there's any specific, we love aha moments. I wonder if there's any specific like turning points or any stories you have about those winds in your path. And maybe was there a point where things took a dramatic directional change or this is just like a steady organic growth for you? So 
Yeah, this is a great question. And one that I think I had a lot of little aha moments along the way that like guided me in a certain direction. For example, I tell the story about being in the field. So, you know, in anthropology, that means I was in Indonesia and I was living in a little village where I was studying the interactions between farmers and endangered monkeys. And I was there with another anthropologist who's a dear friend of mine. And then I was there with a couple of colleagues that were from Italy that were also studying the same species of monkey. But because of how kind of academic departments are set up differently throughout the world, they were from biology instead of anthropology. And so that was this really interesting experience for me and just realizing that for someone interested ultimately in the same species, how we came at it from such different perspectives. Also throughout my training, being an anthropologist, but then, you know, taking courses in wildlife conservation in ecology, for example, I was always kind of viewed as like, oh, the hippie anthropologist who like isn't serious enough about science and like all these little things that just gave me <laughs> this idea of conservation, let's say. Basically this idea that like, oh, I study animals because I don't like people. And I think that's nonsense because you cannot conserve wildlife without working with people. And so it was like little things like that that just piled up throughout my academic career. And then another big aha moment for me was when I realized that I did not want to pursue a PhD. So I loved my research and I loved being in the field so much that I always assumed that I would go get a PhD. And then I slowly realized that I did not want to just be writing papers for other scientists on these topics. And so a big aha for me was when I realized I could write more creatively about these topics, have a wider audience, and really enjoy the work more. <laughs> And so that is, I think, and you know, it was certainly wasn't like, aha, I'm not going to get a PhD. I'm going to write books. It wasn't that simple. But when I trace it back, that was a big, that was a big aha compared to all the little small ahas along the way. Oh, I love that, that insight into the academic path versus sort of a more organic writer path, I guess, because academic writing is very, very specific and has a very certain audience, to your point. But now you've written this wonderful book that's for all of us, <laughs> The Wild Asana Book. And I want you to talk about that. And something you just said before I forget it, you noticed that some people will make the comment that they work with animals because they don't like humans. Is that what you would call, and you use this word in the introduction to your book, which I'm really enjoying reading, by the way. Thank you. Anthropodenial. Tell me how to say it. I say anthropodenial. Okay. <laughs> it's, I don't actually know if that's the proper did, pronunciation. Did you make up that great word? No, that is a primatologist named Franz de Waal. He coined that term. It's not my own. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, Wild Asana is my book that came out in June. It is on um, the subtitle is Animals, Yoga and Connecting Our Practice to the Natural World, which sums it up pretty nicely. But another way that I often like to describe it is kind of like a nature memoir through a yoga lens. So it is essays. Each one is named after an animal that there is also a yoga pose for. And so kind of the spark of inspiration for the book was this idea that we practice these animal poses, but we don't often think about kind of how they came to be that way or why we don't think about either the forms or the behaviors of those animals that kind of made those poses what they are. And when we practice them today, you know, if, you, if you're a serious yoga practitioner, you practice these poses hundreds and thousands of times, you don't even think about the animals that they're named after most of the time that you're that you're in the shapes. And so that was kind of like the spark of inspiration for the book. It is more nature writing. So it's not something that you have to be a yoga practitioner or yoga teacher to enjoy the book. At least that's my hope. And yeah, so what you're referring to, Mary, in the introduction, I set up some terms that are kind of helpful for people thinking about the way that we relate to other animals. And anthropomorphism and anthropodenial are a couple of those terms that I've grappled with a lot in my work that other readers probably haven't thought as much about. So I, I kind of define those terms. And, you know, anthropomorphism is when we attribute human characteristics to 
non-human animals. And I don't like the term non-human, but for the sake of clarity here, <laughs> I'll briefly use it. And so, you know, that's something like for many years in primatology, let's say, you would describe a behavior so devoid of human meaning that it's it almost kind of loses all of its meaning. I give an example in the book when I was studying lemur behavior and a, a kiss would be lip to lip contact. So as not to impose this kind of like human view of the world onto another animal. And my argument is that anthropomorphism is actually really important and that to try and deny it. So the anthropodenial part, which is denying that we as humans are also animals ourselves, that is just a really problematic view of the world that creates separation. And that leads to us being able to exploit or mistreat other beings if we like continue on that path of denying or creating that separation between ourselves and other animals. We talk about that separation, that duality you're talking about between you know uh, humans are outside of the rules of nature. I love that you've made that link with our attitude and relationship with with the, using air quotes, the animal world, because we are animals, but we don't think of ourselves as animals to your point so much that we don't, we just assume that, you know, their behaviors and their emotions or thoughts or whatever. And we don't really know a lot about those, but we assume they're not like ours. And why would we assume that? So I, I think that's kind of where you're going with it. Yeah. And then on the flip side of that, you know, in the scientific world, we have like resisted making those comparisons. And I think that that's also problematic because we, as animals ourselves, we're never objective. Like our view of the world is human. There's no way around that. <laughs> Just like a cat's view of the world is feline. And like we cannot be objective the way science wishes we could be. So I think we embrace that instead of like trying to persist it. Oh, absolutely. That's that's fascinating. So I wanted to talk about like, you know, you were talking about this anthropomorphism and I'm wondering if over the years of your in involvement in this and your, your studying and your research, have you noticed more of sort of a collective embracing of this? And I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of, this is just a casual observation on my part, but suddenly, I guess since COVID, all of a sudden dogs are allowed in so many places they weren't before, you know, more and more restaurants are letting them in, you know, hotels. And I just wonder if this is a little glimpse of something that's happening collectively more so. Am I just making that up or what do you think about that? I hope so. I hope that is the case. I think the example with dogs is an interesting one because I think whatever is happening with dogs might be or hope. I hope that it is kind of a foreshadowing of what will trickle down to other species. I think domestic dogs are perhaps a perfect example of the animal that we are at this point most comfortable anthropomorphizing. And so I think it's a good sign that that, you, that we're observing like more acceptance kind of of our beyond human beings, as I call them, more integrated into our lives. But I also, for example, in the dog chapter of Wild Asana, I write about some of those contradictions or the, the cognitive dissonance, a domestic dog, the way that society treats domestic dogs versus the way that we treat coyotes, for example. So a species that is very genetically and behaviorally similar to the dogs that are living in our houses are still treated as pests to a lot of folks and just like shot for existing on people's property. And so those feelings of affection or care or even love towards our pet dogs don't necessarily jump the boundary to their wild counterparts. And so that's something that I think is really important to like reflect on <laughs> and look pretty deeply at because it can happen even like on an in like within ourselves as well as on like a societal or collective level that we have these boundaries in our minds somehow about, well, this is appropriate for this kind of dog, but not for this kind of dog. And why do we think that way? And how does that change our behavior toward them? Wolves, you know, in the conservation community, wolves are a very polarizing 
divisive topic because you've got people who love wolves and then you've got people who honestly despise them and probably everything in between and their dogs too. So I love that observation. And I think it just helps us to kind of reflect more on how, like, again, on the nuance of those relationships with different kinds of dogs and what are the boundaries in our minds of where dogs belong and what behaviors we accept and which ones we don't. I see those boundaries enlarging. Like I was saying, the dogs all of a sudden, I guess since COVID, you know, so many people got dogs during COVID. So now post-COVID, like I was saying, you know, they're allowed more places. I have another observation about it, if I may. Since we've been taking our dog more places, since we can, we have noticed that having her with us just really invites interaction with people that we wouldn't have spoken with before. Everybody comes up and it's immediate. They'll, they'll tell you about their dog or they had used to have a dog like that or their dog looks like that or, or oh, a lot of times we'll hear, I wish I missed my dog. I wish I could have her here with me. And then we talk about our dog and then... That leads to other conversation. And before you know it, you've had this very nice, warm interaction with a perfect stranger in a public setting. And it's just this amazing feeling that's kind of new to be out in the world, just interacting with strangers because of the dog. I love that. Yeah. Animals, they connect us. They connect us with others. Absolutely. And we've been having to travel a lot lately because we have to go down to Tennessee where my parents are. My parents need a lot of care and we're far away. So we take our dog. And, uh, you know, one example of this is like, you know, we're I'm going to see my dad in the hospital. My husband's outside with the dog. And again, these people waiting in front of the hospital for their ride or whatever. And we're, we're talking to them. It's just amazing. And that's just not a, something we normally would be doing. Yeah. I almost chased a neighbor down the sidewalk the other day because he had an affin pincher. My mom has an affin pincher. And I've probably seen this guy like so many times before, but until I saw him with his dog, <laughs> like yeah. I didn't I didn't have any <laughs> need to connect with him. You know, that's just the way that it goes. <laughs> Perfect example. So I kind of think our dogs are going to save the world. That's what I think. Oh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I have a question going back to something you were saying earlier about the coyotes and the wolves and sort of our own boundaries. And we just have different perceptions about the different animals. And definitely the first thing that comes to my head is, well, those animals are very threatening and there's a lot of fear around that. And I think a lot of that threat and fear is super valid. Absolutely. There's obviously a spectrum like the answer here isn't like all animals like we just you know, whatever, because a lot of these are predators too. So, and at what point is it like, do humans actually like have dominion or whatever? I don't know. It's a very, I mean, this is like why you wrote this book, but I'm just really interested in that and what your response is to, to that threat that we feel. Yes. So I do go into this more kind of about our evolutionary fear of, let's say, wolves or any animal that has the ability to harm us or to harm our livelihood. I'm talking about a rancher who hates coyotes or wolves. That is absolutely valid. It's the same way that I talk about a landowner who's a beaver is flooding their crops, let's say. And, you know, that animal is directly and negatively somehow impacting their livelihood, potentially their survival, potentially their identity. And so these are very valid questions and problems. And all that I ask of people in those scenarios is to look critically at the problem itself, separate from kind of this entire like societal, historical, all of these almost like ideas that have become bigger than the animals themselves. So those fears, for example, the fear of a rancher of coyotes, has that been passed down and maybe blown out of proportion in a way that the hatred of the coyotes is more than the damage that the coyotes might cause? And then is the reaction to that something that's actually productive or is it something that's just kind of become culturally ingrained? So for example, killing every coyote you see is actually in many places and cases making the coyote problem worse because coyotes respond 
to that hunting pressure by having more babies. So it becomes this kind of cascade where the solution that matches up to kind of like the person's emotion or historical understanding of the problem, it's mismatching with the actual solution. And so while the fear is valid or while the concern for the effect of this animal on their livelihood is absolutely valid, my only point in this whole thing is to say, consider the specific situation you're in, the specific individuals that you're interacting with, separate from maybe like generations and generations of your grandparents and your great-grandparents dealing with something similar. It's like thinking about the way that we think about our, our personal health or that we probably should be thinking about our personal health. It's like, we're so used to treating the symptom and not the underlying issue. And it's almost like whatever is happening that's making people angry or scared or the animal threatening life or livelihood is a symptom of something and not necessarily. And so treating, killing the animal would be like treating the symptom. Right. And in my beaver work, I'll give another example of that. Like, you know, someone might get really upset because a beaver is cutting down certain trees. And when you kind of get deeper into what's actually going on, it's not that the landowner was particularly attached to those trees that came down, but it's more this feeling of loss of control over what's happening on their property. And so it, again, it's very nuanced <laughs> and it's, it's a tough part of this work to say, what is the actual problem here? Because, you know, I can protect trees from getting chewed down. I know exactly how to do that. But is that the actual problem? Or do we have to address a larger thing here of there's a rodent dramatically changing what this person's property used to look like. And that's something that is more kind of social, cultural, that takes a lot more work to address than just putting a cage around a tree. <laughs> so. so interesting. I have a personal really great example of this. I feel very vulnerable talking about it, but I will. It's okay, mom. It's a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> I might decide to cut it out later. <laughs> I don't know. Don't. It's so good. Okay. I'm so curious. See. Okay. So I'll tell this story. <laughs> Recently, in the last few weeks, we've become very aware that we had some sort of creature living in the wall behind our, in, in our kitchen, behind the sink and the dishwasher. And it was m making a lot of, of noise. And, you know, at first, you know, you're just, you're looking around and going, what's that? And then you go, okay, something is back there. Boy, were we hoping it was a chipmunk or something, you know? But we had these wildlife cameras because we live on a farm. And so my husband started setting them up at night. And pretty soon it became evident that, uh, no, it was not a chipmunk. It was not a cute little squirrel. It did not have a fluffy tail. It was a rat. And it came out at night and it would walk around and, you know, it would get, you know, any kind of food. If we first discovered it back when the, you know, there were a lot of peaches. So we had peaches on the kitchen table. It would get a peach and take it back to its little thing. And we were watching all this. And so then we got all the have a heart traps and it would come out and it would like look in the trap. It wouldn't go in. It would walk around. It would go around to where the fruit was or whatever and try to nibble it from the back. Obviously very intelligent. So it got to where like every morning we're watching this thing on the camera and we na we've named it. <laughs> and his and name is, love him. <laughs> and, well, it's very original. His name is Ratty. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that original? I love it. <laughs> so and we still haven't caught him. I really don't know what to do about it. Obviously, is unless we just I don't know. Do you have any advice for this? And I and, <laughs> And it, it just, it seems, it seems to be one and it doesn't, it, this is, sounds so weird to say, but it doesn't really bother us. And we just make sure there's no food it out What's at night. What's funny is that it did. Like at first it really did. And you're like, ew. And then it like. Well, yeah. When I came in the kitchen and there would be like, you know, a beautiful peach with a few bites out of it. I'm like, no, uh-uh, no. But it, we just put the food away. And so, yeah, so obviously we have to like get it to move on somehow. I think, I guess, I don't know. Help me with this, Allison. <laughs> so 
<laughs> Thank you so much for sharing this story. Thanks for sharing, because Mary. <laughs> this is like the, I mean, you know, we don't all have tons of land with beavers and coyotes and everything, but we've all had a rodent in our house, right? And, or some other small little critter. I was worried you were going to say groundhog because I, in, in my work with beavers, there's a lot of confusion of groundhog versus beaver. And then people will find out it's not a beaver and it's a groundhog. And they'll be like, well, what do I do? And I'm like, I don't know. Beavers don't dig holes. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you're going to be sharing your garden with a groundhog or you're going to kill a groundhog. And sometimes those are the only options. But I think, Mary, you're you're already going through this like process, through this story of like deciding what you're willing to live with. <laughs> like knowing what the animal was was important to you, right? Mm-hmm. You you wanted to identify what it was to understand the situation better. And now you're kind of in this phase of you're a little bit attached to the the animal that you've been sharing space with, but you're also not sure if it's a long-term plan to have it (laughs) living in your kitchen and eating your peaches. And so this is like such an amazing example of just like a very normal process. And, you know, what I will say, I think you've also observed how intelligent rats are. I think if you were to actually ever trap this thing live and try to remove it, that it would probably come back unless you moved it very far away because this rat is living the good life <laughs> in, your, in your house. And I have used snap traps on mice in my own home. And it's a hard thing. It's something that I don't love. But in the end, there is always kind of like this spectrum of choice. And so if you do come to the conclusion that you are going to have to kill another animal because the situation is not working out for you. Like health-wise, for example, perhaps there are concerns about then doing it in the most humane way is all you can, like that's the next phase. It sounds like live trapping this rat is challenging. And like I said, like it would probably come, (laughs) it would probably come back inside. But, you know, there's poison and glue traps and things I would never, ever recommend because of how inhumane and horrible they are and how indiscriminately they harm other beings. And then there are the ones that ideally and in most cases cause minimal suffering to solve the problem. And sometimes in my work, I do have to tell people like killing the animal is the only option if you cannot live with this, this and this. And then it's that person's choice and just considering the most humane option is all you can do. And there's nothing to feel guilty about with that. Honestly, sitting here thinking, I just don't know if we could do that. You know, I mean, it. And maybe you can't. I, 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 but, okay, I'm going to ask you this. Is there a chance, like, uh, we've been very, very diligent about no food in the kitchen at night, nothing. And we haven't filmed the last few nights because we've been out of town. But (laughs) is it possible that he'll just go away? Sure, that's possible. This gets into the realm of me having to try and predict what wild animals will do. (laughs) (laughs) I'm always telling people I can't necessarily do that. I will say with fall coming and like winter getting closer, it's less and less likely that the rat would just want to leave on its own. Um, I do consider the things like the seasons and kind of like the life history of the animals themselves. Not that I'm a rat expert, but it seems the cooler it gets, the less and less likely that the rat would want to leave on its own. But possible always. I mean, I guess this isn't possible in an old farmhouse to some extent, but like obviously he's getting like, you know, his entry points to the kitchen, like maybe closing those up or something. So something like a rat might always find a way. Yeah. It is a great, like, preventative strategy, of course, a great place to start. But for something that is really smart and can squeeze through really tiny spaces, that might be really tricky. I always feel like when when the advice is to seal your house, you know, like for the stink bugs and, you know, all these things that say, oh, just find, you know, find all the openings in your house. I'm I'm laughing because we live in a literally a 200 year old farmhouse and like you, you don't you know, it just, no, (laughs) there are probably not going to happen. And rodents chew new holes. I've also had squirrels in my attic. Like we, we joke that the rodents 
feel like they have a safe place here in my house because that's the work that I do. <laughs> so even if you close everything up, they would probably just chew a new way in. Well, I will say that we used to have like a, a really annoying mouse problem, but we had this cat show up. Literally, she just came to us. She, she literally is a long story, but she moved to our house from a neighboring farm that had several dogs. And it was just like, she just said, I, I don't want to live here anymore. I'm going to go over there. And she came over and we we do not have a mouse problem anymore. It is amazing what perfect a solution. really good mouser can do. And she just, she came to us out of the blue. But she's not killing this rat. So. No, I don't know if they, you know, on the films, on the wildlife camp. <laughs> We see her walking around, you know, his little place where he comes in and out from behind the dishwasher. So I think she knows he's there. I don't know. Maybe she'll get him someday. I don't know. But anyway, thank you for letting me talk about it. And I just, I'll, I'll have to send you an update or since you don't live that far away, I'll, you know, maybe I'll, I don't know. <laughs> send me your camera footage. I would love to <laughs> I want to see Ratty. It's really cute. Sometimes he like looks at the camera. Rats have a lot of personality. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> Here is, is the most bizarre thing. Here we are having our morning coffee, <laughs> watching the videos from the night before. It's it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> I love that. I'm okay. a little jealous of this story. <laughs> uh, well, when if we catch him live, I might take him across the river. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good strategy. <laughs> I think rats can swim, but I'm not sure. <laughs> they seem to be pretty amazing creatures for yeah. you know what we're learning. So you've mentioned it a, a little bit, but can you tell us a little bit more about your work with the Human Beaver Coexistence Fund? Because it's kind of ties into this conversation too. Yeah. So I founded the organization a little over two years ago. And we help landowners to manage what I call in quotes, beaver problems. We do a lot of education and outreach so that people understand first and foremost why beavers are important, why beavers matter. And again, we're often appealing to, you know, the ecological reasons why beavers are so important for us and for other species. So, for example, the fact that they store lots of water on the landscape and kind of refill groundwater, help with stream restoration, improve water quality because beaver dams act like giant water filters. You know, they create habitat for lots of other species, many of which are kind of threatened wetland species that, you know, were more concerned about their conservation status. So beavers, because of the things that they do to survive themselves, have all of these ripple effects out for other species and for the landscape itself. And the other big part of what we do is to actually address those problems that people are facing um, that are caused by beavers. So tree felling and flooding is the big one, especially when flooding is occurring in a place where you cannot have water, such as on a roadway or on your driveway or your garden or, you know, places where people really do not want extra water being stored. So, yeah, I basically saw a need for this kind of work in the region. I was working at a nature preserve that had beavers on the property, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a live beaver. This was back in 2018. Just started to learn all about them, and the story goes that beavers filled the monkey-sized hole in my heart. So I had come back from Indonesia and was, you know, looking for this different kind of career that would kind of keep me you know, in my own home and interacting with animals that, that my own ancestors interacted with, the whole longer story there. But I just learned a lot about beavers. And then people would start coming to me with beaver questions. And I thought, hmm, this is something that people need in this area. And there were similar organizations in other parts of the country, but nothing kind of here in the mid-Atlantic. And so um, we got started a couple of years ago. It's really fun work and challenging and fulfilling. And I get to work with lots of different kinds of people with different ideas about nature and yeah, still do the kind of kind of human wildlife conflict coexistence work that I was doing with with primates before I just switched over to beavers. I have just a general question about beavers before they started cohabitating with humans and they were just left to do whatever they wanted in, in the environment. Were they destructive or did, did they, I mean, I guess they really changed the landscape. Before the fur trade to like pre like 1600, let's say, 
there were an estimated 400 million beavers in North America. There were beavers in every little stream system, every valley of most of the country. <laughs> Obviously, there are some differences in habitat type and everything. There were so many more beavers than there were today. And they were almost completely wiped out during the fur trade because their pelts were basically like currency and people were turning them into felted hats. And then, you know, numbers were so low that we are almost still seeing the kind of growing population again of beavers. And of course, there's a lot less available habitat now for them. So that's what's making conflict with people so much more obvious. <laughs> but in reality, the beavers are just coming back to the areas where they have always been. You know, everything is more paved over and more developed. And the streams are in really bad shape in a lot of cases because of, you know, cattle have having been in the streams for so long and erosion is so bad. And these are all things that beavers, if allowed to remain, they would eventually kind of restore the landscape. But in some of the cases, you know, we just can't have beavers in some of these places anymore because of the problems that they're causing for, for people. So it's a tricky situation. Beavers, to your question about how destructive they are, like from a human perspective, They've always been destructive in the sense that they need to take down trees to build their homes, build their dams. They've always been flooding like little stream valleys because they need the deeper water to escape from land predators and to survive the winter. So they have always been destructive in that sense from our perspective because that is what they need to do to survive. But destructive on one hand is also really regenerative and beneficial to other species too. Oh, I guess that's my question. Like, well, you know, <clears throat> what was their purpose in the environment, you know, before they started conflicting with human goals? Yeah, they're, they're keystone species, which means that they really shape the landscape in a way that has implications far beyond like what they do that for. Because <laughs> obviously beavers are only doing that for themselves. They're not thinking like, I'm going to build a wetland habitat for all my wetland friends. <laughs> like, they want to survive, right? But because of the extent to which they're changing the landscape and having all of these other ripple effects, <laughs> um, they are considered a keystone species and supporting lots of other natural processes and other, other species along the way. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I was groping for like what is their function in a wild landscape or in a non-human landscape that's so interesting I mean I could talk for so long about what those functions are like out west in particular there's so much exciting research going on about the way that they even help to slow the spread of wildfires and provide places where other wildlife can go during a wildfire to literally survive the burn and then kind of re help that area regenerate faster afterward. Like it is incredible some of the impacts that beavers can have on lots of different things, water quality, stream function, wildfire, flood prevention. I mean, because they're storing water up higher in a watershed, it's preventing the catastrophic effects of flooding downstream in more developed areas. I could go on. That's just so amazing. People need to know this. <laughs> I agree. That's what, we're, that's what we're working on. Allison, how do you think that the conservation movement as a whole has evolved in the last couple of decades? And more would you like to see happening in the conservation space? It is very encouraging overall what I have seen changes that I have seen in the field of conservation in my time in this career. A conservationists always have to acknowledge kind of the colonial history of the discipline and recognize that we're still kind of shifting away from this approach that is very valuing Western science over other ways of knowing. And I think that the conservation world is slowly, <laughs> finally, <laughs> however you want to say it, growing in a positive way to include other perspectives like indigenous 
science, traditional ecological knowledge, becoming more diverse and inclusive in just the types of people that are doing conservation. This is a discussion that we've been having in the beaver world lately, where it's kind of alarming that in 2023, we're still talking about these things. But, you know, something like the work that I do where I travel to a rural area and I might be out on a property that doesn't have access to, you know, cell service. Do all types of people that might want to do this work, do they feel safe in that type of environment? And I think we're having more of those conversations about how to make the field, how to make this work more safe and inclusive for all types of people with different identities. And I think we're slowly moving in that right direction. I do also see a lot more integration of social science into conservation. So I talked about that a little bit in the beginning too, that, you know, it used to be just so focused on the wildlife to the exclusion of all of the human aspects. And I think we're improving on that as well and recognizing how important that is. But I'm excited to be a part of this kind of era of conservation to hopefully help keep moving that in the right direction. Yeah. So on this podcast, we always ask our guests, what does slow living mean to you? I love this. And I feel like sometimes I'm the horrible person to ask because I feel like I'm not a good, doing a good job of slow living. Me too, actually. So it's okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's a goal. It's a goal. I don't think I'm doing a great job of it at this season of my life. Slow living to me means remembering that we're animals and being curious about other beings. You know, we could go through our life on autopilot and be living like next to or even sharing our house with these other animals that we're not paying any attention to even though we are we are connected with them, whether we realize it or not, but to like just get more curious about who they are. Like this is, I don't know, it's how I like create meaning out of life. <laughs> and so, you know, it doesn't have to be yoga, but the example in yoga is that when you're in fish pose, like think about what life is like for a fish. Just like get curious. If you're in tree pose, like I was in tree pose the other day, just wondering, like, this is an asymmetrical pose and it teaches us balance. Does a tree have any sense of balance? Does a tree, you know, with branches, different weights on different sides of it, like, does it have a sense of that? Like, what is it like to be a tree? And just like getting really curious, allowing ourselves like permission to just wonder about other animals and their lives and allowing ourselves permission to compare ourselves to them because we're more alike than we are different. That's my version of slow living. Oh, I love that so much. And and thank you for tying it back into your book. The book is full of these exercises and the, the poses that you present are all like just wonderful practices and slow living and mindfulness and imagination and curiosity and all those things that we say are associated with slow living. It's just just a treasure trove of experiencing slow living through these yoga postures. So thank you so much. And I really hope that they are accessible. You know, so like I said, even if you don't practice yoga, many of the practices that are included at the end of each chapter are intended for people who might even be intimidated by the thought of a yoga practice. And it's it's kind of very simple ways into this approach that are accessible for lots of different types of folks with different interests. So I hope that that's useful for people. Yes. And I'll add here that also yoga has been a big part of my life. I'm, I'm a trained yoga teacher as well. And I am recently, and I'll also be very vulnerable and tell the world this, I was recently diagnosed with osteoporosis. So I have bone density issues, which I need to address very proactively right now. One of the poses that's highly recommended to do several times a week is the tree pose, what you were just talking about, because it's weight bearing and it helps you develop balance. And all this is so important to your bone development. So I love thinking about a tree 
and how strong and sturdy it is. And you think just the structure of a tree is bears so much weight and it's, it, it withstands wind and it withstands development all around it. And, and it's just such a goal when I'm thinking of my of strengthening my bones to identify with a tree not only is physiologically very, very ad- advantageous, but it also takes me there in my imagination, and, and which I know is a help as well. So, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Allison, what does the good dirt mean to you? I love this one. I have been listening to your podcast for a while and always wondering how I would answer this. Aww, <laughs> now fun. I get to answer it. <laughs> the good dirt to me. So I think of dirt as like symbolic for the earth. And I have been really embracing this idea lately that I've read a couple of different places. Robin Wall Kimmerer wrote about it. And then a book that I recently read called Mirrors in the Earth. It's our book club pick. Awesome. Yeah. And we had her on, well, we interviewed her not long ago. So her interview will be published soon. Well, and we share the same publisher too. So that's exciting. Oh, cool. But the idea that for the good earth is this earth that loves us back. You know, we are nature lovers and animal lovers and like someone like me whose career and like life is about loving the earth and all of her creatures, that she's not indifferent to us in return. And that to be in a true, meaningful, like interconnected relationship means that it's like a mutual love and respect and I think that is what the good dirt is meaning to me these days and that's hard it's it's not so easy to believe that the earth always loves us back especially considering our collective impact on the dirt the earth sometimes But it's a beautiful idea. And I think the more that we can embrace that and really believe it, the better off we'll be in our relationship with other beings. And when we recognize how much the earth wants to heal itself, when we allow it to, and how much she wants to heal us as well, I think I feel very strongly. And and the more we embrace the living things around us, the plants and the animals, and identify with them and allow ourselves to have the imagination and the curiosity to think in the, in that way, then we can feel that love that you're talking about. So I just think that's beautiful. And don't feed ourselves up when we're not feeling that way. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think, I think it's not necessarily easy or like immediately intuitive, but wow, is it powerful to consider that. Yes, so much. So in in wrapping up, is there anything else you'd like to say that we didn't cover in the conversation or what do you want most want people to understand about about your work? Yeah, I think most of all that and I think I've been hinting at this or I may have even already said it that it's what I'm suggesting sound sometimes can sound really like pie in the sky like we're one with all the other animals on the planet like that sounds very (laughs) abstract and very hard to grapple with that idea but it's actually can be very easy to begin it can be accessible to anyone you don't have to hike more or camp more or change who you are it just starts with a little bit of curiosity and a little bit of wondering about another being like right where you are right now, even if it is a rat in your kitchen and it doesn't have to be yoga, whoever you are right now, wherever you are right now, like you can, you can do this. Just have to wonder and follow your curiosity and consider the life of another being in a way that maybe you didn't before. That's how really accessible it can be. I hope that is what people take away from it. Beautiful. Namaste. (laughs) I I love that so much. Yes. Well, this has been so, so lovely. Thank you so much for coming. And I look forward to chatting again, hopefully soon. Thank you so much, Allison. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. 
calling in and spreading the good dirt. We love hearing from you. You can reach our listener voicemail at 443-459-1950. That's 443-459-1950. You can find this number in our show notes and in our Instagram profile. This show is produced by Lady Farmer, a slow living lifestyle community. And the original music is composed and performed by John Kingsley. For more from Lady Farmer, follow us on Instagram at We Are Lady Farmer. That's We Are Lady Farmer. Or join us online at www.ladyfarmer.com. We'll see you next time on The Good Dirt. Goodbye.